guys. Welcome back to the That You May Know Him podcast. I'm your host, Blake Barbera. Happy to be back with you once again for another edition of the show. I'm joined once again by my good friend, Rich Russell, and this is part 12 of our ongoing series, God Save America. Rich, welcome back, brother. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well, and and uh, I, I just have to give a kudos to the podcast um, <clears throat> because this has not been just a uh, an intellectual or theological discussion with me. It's really been a genuine struggle, and and you know maybe some of your listeners have heard the struggle of really trying to fight through what is truth. Um, and this battle between the passivity that I, I'm hearing passivity. When you talk Revelation 5 and, and yeah. the Sermon on the Mount, I hear yeah. passivity, and I go sideways, yeah. even though it's truth. <laughs> I still go sideways, yeah. but yeah. I, I can't go to the other extreme. You nailed me last week. It was like, I can't go to the other stream and, and, and buy into uh, violence as a, as a solution. And it, yeah. it really tweaked me. It really, like, it really triggered me. Like, what's the alternative to these unacceptable solutions to me? And, yes. and I feel like I had a breakthrough. It's like, it's, you know, some things, you know, like we've alluded to some <laughs> of the things on some of the podcasts that I've ultimately I'd uh-huh. like to share, but, but, but there comes a moment when you know that, you know, that, you know. Yeah. And like, I am firm in my, I've the podcast, if it, if it, if it, if it doesn't, if it doesn't impact anybody but me, then the podcast was worth it. Is that too narcissistic? Awesome. No uh, way. But man. I've, that's beautiful. I've had my breakthrough. I've, I've had my breakthrough, and I'm absolutely convinced. And, um, and if not this episode, the next episode, we may have to label this as a spiritually R-rated uh, podcast for <laughs> the exposure. Uh, that needs to take place uh, for us to, if we're going to have any kind of breakthrough in uh, in America, you know, the yeah. truths that we need yeah. to talk about today and the, maybe the next podcast uh, need to be brought up as 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 yeah. um, as controversial as they may be. Yeah, that's how all real, genuine person to person ministry happens, Rich. It's an outflow and an overflow of your wrestling with the Lord and sitting with him. I can tell you've been wrestling with God because your beard looks like it's getting more white. So uh, <laughs> that must be a sign of some really, really good stuff that's been going on with you, in my opinion. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Right now, right now, I, I look more homeless than, than a sage. Uh, but, <laughs> There's nothing uh, like having a real, genuine conversation. Yes, we're having a theological conversation, but we're a couple of brothers who are also trying to really seek the Lord's heart. And it's theological because we both value and honor uh, scripture and believe in scripture's ultimate authority and full inspiration. But we're not just trying to come up with a theological solution to these difficult questions. We're trying to discern the Lord's heart. And so, uh, but we'll get people caught up. Last episode of God Save America, we were talking about Christians and violence, and we were asking the question, how do we respond uh, to these various situations where it would seem like violence is, the opportunity for violence is presented to us? And we talked about Revelation 5, when John looks up to behold the Lion of Judah, and instead of seeing a lion, he sees a slain lamb. And we talked about how important and significant that is when it comes to the message of Jesus's life and what he expected of his disciples, which is, I don't expect you to overcome and conquer through violence and bloodshed. I expect you to overcome and conquer through following me and through staying devoted to me. And what did the lamb do? How did he overcome sin and death? Not by defeating his enemies, not by shedding their blood, but by laying his life down and shedding his own blood. So what Rich is talking about is, okay. I mean, if we just, boil it all down. If America is going out the window, do we have the right to fight? Should we pick up weapons and go shed some blood in order to save it? And I think what I hear Rich saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not our job. It's not our job to be passive or to pick up weapons. It's our job to seek the Lord and to seek his heart and to, and to intercede. Is that what I hear you saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, we, we can be active. The, 
the two scriptures that I want to get into, but I, I really want to head into this. You know, we, we had asked a question last week at the end. It was like, you know, yeah, yeah. The, about the deception of the elect. Uh, and and I, I'd like to kind of lay a foundation for that. But, you know, Thank spoiler you. alert, yep. the uh, the the, um, uh, the weapons of our warfare are are powerful and effective uh, spiritually that our, our carnal weapons of political solutions and violence uh, is is is. Um, insignificant compared to the power we have in the spirit through primarily intercession. And then the other is, you know, what I brought up before second Chronicles seven fourteen, yeah. or if my people turn to me, uh, and, and pray, uh, yeah. I will heal their and, and repent of their wicked ways. I, that's, that's a really critical aspect to, yeah. to success, uh, yeah. in our, in our intercession, um, then he'll heal our land. And yeah. if we, if the bottom line is, if we look at the condition of America, the responsibility yep. falls squarely on the church. And that's where I really want to get into it at some point in time in this broadcast or the next one, you know, yep. we need to start, we need to start clearly identifying uh, the deception in the church and the practices of the church. Yep. Um, uh, and, and so that's kind of the lead in for uh, where I hope we go. Well, well, these Definitely. are never scripted conversations, but you know that's They're kind not. of like my my anticipation. Definitely, and I I appreciate you bringing us back full circle to where we said we were going to pick up at the end of the last episode, which is Jesus said that in the great tribulation, I like to call it the the great trouble or the big trouble because that's sort of a, a way of talking about the last last days in a way that's more specific for me than I think most people usually are. We talk about, we talk about the last days, um, like, like scripture calls the great tribulation, the last days, but actually scripture says we've been living in the last days for 2000 years. Uh, we're talking about the last little blip of time in the last days, which we both think is, well, we don't think we know it's coming on the world. Uh, it could be in our lifetimes, maybe not, but Jesus said that during that time of the greatest, persecution, tribulation, suffering, judgment that will ever take place, if possible, even the elect will be deceived. And we left off by saying we're going to get into what that could or maybe what that does currently look like. If the elect are being deceived or could be deceived, how will that go down? In our context, what does it look like for God's people to be deceived? Um with what's happening around us in, in this conversation of how do we contend for America and stay faithful to the kingdom. So what do you think, Rich? What's it looking like? Uh, you know, that's interesting. You brought up the last days have been going on for 2000 years and the deception has been going on for 2000 years. There has been, yeah. you know, there, yeah. and, and I believe the deception has been increasing, uh, you know, even, uh, even scripture talks about in the first century, there are already antichrists among you. Yep. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, I, I think of, uh, even, uh, for some reason yesterday I was thinking about Barabbas. Huh? Barabbas was the, was the, uh, leader of the political rebellion against the Roman empire. Yep. Yep. And, Love and, yep. And, and who did they choose? They chose Barabbas. They chose a political solution yeah. over, uh, over Christ. Yep. And, and Absolutely. when they saw that he was not going to be a political solution, they said, crucify him. Yep. You know, this is, this is go, goes down to the, the depth of the depravity wow. of the heart wow. of, of humanity and, and yep. our, and religion puts a veneer on it to, uh, yeah to say we're okay. So yeah. let me, let me, let me just drop a bombshell and, and this is probably premature to do this, but I, through these, through these 12 podcasts, I think I've come to the conclusion that, that God looks at the depravity in the church the same way the church looks at the depravity in the world. <laughs> okay. And we okay. refuse to, and we refuse to look at ourselves. Not one voice have I heard uh, yeah. since the, you know, since the, um, uh, 
since the lockdowns began, and the church, by their actions, demonstrated that Jesus was not essential. Yeah, they thought it more important to submit to government than than to turn in obedience to Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and even today, even today, I do not hear a voice yeah. saying this is what the church must do. We must stop our silly uh, entertainment based concert style teacher centric services that distract us from the presence of God, and we've got to humble ourselves and and get on our faces and say, God, we need to get real with you. Yeah. The condi- the 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 condition of America is 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 the full weight and responsibility on the church. Yeah. And we can unpack that a little bit, but but you think about the deception. We've talked about Constantine and uh, the paganism yep. that was brought into the church from the fourth yep. century. Yeah. Uh, so this is not something, and the Enlightenment, I think, polluted the beauty of the Reformation, yep. uh, because all of a sudden it became totally. human understanding. Human understanding, uh, the foundation for humanism is human understanding is the final authority. Yep. When you apply that, that to Scripture being the final authority, and then you give it to man to interpret that Scripture— Oh. It's it's a it's a recipe for what we're living today, brother. You're getting my you you you're getting my wheels spinning too. And you know what it is theologically theologically, it's a recipe for five point Calvinism. <laughs> I wasn't going to go there, uh, but uh, yeah, I was I was actually um, I, I was actually just pondering the the uh, the thought of what the foundation of true Christianity is. And, and Mm -hmm. okay, I'll go there. Let's just head Mm -hmm. into it. Let's, let's Uh just, you know, let's lose some listeners early. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So I believe that, that there is going to be a great falling away because of the deception. Says, says as much Matthew Thessalonians, just to put some teeth to it. Yeah. It's called the apostasia in Greek. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and, and I believe that, Apart from a revelation of Jesus Christ, we are subject to deception. That's why it says, mm-hmm. if possible, the elect. The elect are yep. those who have had a revelation of Jesus Christ. Matthew 16, 18 says he's going to build his church on a revelation of Jesus Christ, mm, not the intellectual yeah. knowledge. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've become so teacher-centric in this, you know, in this Enlightenment era of Christianity that uh-huh. everything's about knowledge. Everything's uh-huh. about the power of man and the knowledge of man. Uh, it's uh-huh. not about revelation. First Corinthians two. I encourage everyone to read First Corinthians two, uh, uh-huh. with with um, uh, with Paul exhorting people to to want to to pursue to ponder the knowledge of God through the power of the Spirit that lives Absolutely. within us, rather than human understanding. As a matter yeah. of fact, human understanding is enmity with Christ. Yep. Yeah. And First Corinthians it's, two is an eloquent expression of this difference between intellectual knowledge and revelation that only comes through surrender and devotion. Uh, can and I read part of that? God. Yes, please. Can I read part of that? And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony or the witness of God with lofty speech or with wisdom. For I determined to know nothing, not one thing, when I was among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. In other words, I was humble and trembling before God that my witness before you would be nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And my speech and my message were not with enticing words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Oh, I mean, and it goes on in verse 10 and it says, God has revealed these things to us by the spirit for the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God for who among men knows the things of a man, except a man's spirit within him so too. No one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Mm-hmm. Now, we may, 
we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things that are freely given to us by God. And we speak about these things, not with words taught to us by human wisdom, Mm -hmm. but with those taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. Yeah. Um, and then it, it, it closes with this. I think it's in, uh, verse 14. Yeah. Um, but boy, I no, I don't want to read that one. I'll scare too many people. Um, then <laughs> I will. It, the natural <laughs> person does not receive the things of the spirit of God because to them, they are foolishness and he is not able to understand the things of the spirit of God because the things of the spirit of God are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges or weighs all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? That's a quote, by the way. But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. So it takes communion with God yes. to prevent deception. It's yes. Having our Bible is not sufficient. And I think a lot of the deception comes, uh, comes across by the doctrines and traditions of men claiming to base it on scripture, but it's through mm-hmm. their human understanding, not through a revelation of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And we are subject to, we are far too subject to teachers when first John exhorts us to say, we have no need of a teacher because we have the unction. We have Christ in us. We have mm-hmm that that giver of wisdom within us that can discern any situation at any time through communion with him. Mm-hmm. So with that found, I, I just want to give a biblical example that, that was a revelation to me. And when Jesus spoke, uh, when, when, when Jesus spoke, you shall eat my flesh and drink my blood, everyone mm-hmm. fell away. But at mm-hmm. the time, he had the best church in history. I mean, who wouldn't want to listen to one of his sermons? Who wouldn't, you know, they saw the signs, they saw the wonders, they saw the miracles, they saw the dead rays, they saw miracles performed of all kinds. And yet, and yet when, when he gave that sermon, everyone fell away except 12. The 12, yep. And Jesus asked him, Mm -hmm. you won't leave me also, will you? And what was Mm -hmm. Peter's response? How can we? Never. Yeah. We know who you are. And Jesus' yeah. response was, it's because the Father has revealed it to yeah. you who I am. They did not yeah. fall away because they had a revelation. And all mm. the churchianity and all the and and all the great sermons and you know, we can go ahead and perform signs and wonders. Part of the deception that's coming in the end times is mm-hmm. that the enemy is going to be performing signs and wonders. If we're mm-hmm. dependent upon signs and wonders for truth, mm-hmm. we're going to be deceived. Oh, I completely agree. I don't want to get you off track, but do you think Judas had a revelation? Jesus, what, what do you mean? Do you, do you think Judas Iscariot have a, had a revelation of Jesus? Oh, Jesus, Judas, Judas. Judas, yeah. Judas, yeah. Jude was his name, but I understand why people named Jude didn't want to go by Jude back then. Yeah, I th- that is so fascinating, and and t- to be honest, I th- think it gets down to the doctrine of free will. Mm. I think, mm. if possible, even the elect mm-hmm. could be deceived. Mm-hmm. What was yep. what was Judas's motivation? He may have had a, he may have had a revelation. Go ahead. Yeah. No, 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 no. Go ahead. I didn't want to cut you off. I, he, I, I have an answer to that. Well, I have a thought on that, but yeah. I believe that he could very well have had a revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah. But the motive of his following him was money. Yep. Yes. He was a lover of money. Yes. 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 And when And when he wasn't going to get the power... This is so important for us to understand when he wasn't going to get the power, when he wasn't going to get the money, when he wasn't going to have his desires fulfilled according to his desires, rather than surrendering to God's desires for him, I think he made a decision and he regretted it. He was sorrowful, but he never deeply repented because the root motive in his heart was money. And, yep. and I've got a, one of the things that may come up in our conversation is, you know, is 
is can we really tell the difference in America between Christianity and capitalism? Oh boy, that's a good one. So, uh, and we definitely got to, we got to go there. Uh, I think most Christians would not, not blink twice uh, when they would, if you ask them, is capitalism a good thing or not? Of course it is. Look at what it's done for us. Meanwhile, half the world's starving and we're buying bigger houses and getting more expensive cars. But uh, so Judas, in my opinion, and I haven't even thought about this before having this live conversation. I think he had to know who Jesus was in order to betray him. You can't betray the son of man if you don't have a revelation of who the son of man is. Wow. And so I think he absolutely had to know, but I think exactly what you said, what does James say? You and I are both high on the book of James right now. And I love the book of James I have for years. And I, I hope I always do. It says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then when des- then desire, when it, is, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. In the context of that passage, oh, go ahead. No, I, I want to hear you the, finish this. This is great. The, the context of that passage is someone walking into your church who doesn't who who doesn't look like a person of repute and of esteem and you saying ah go sit over there in the back and then someone else walking into your church who looks like a rich person and saying oh come over here and sit in this really fine seat how much do we as americans and how much of how much of of american christianity's hardcore fight and battle for America is rooted in the fact that we love all of our crap and our materialism and not in the fact that we actually have the opportunity to worship God freely in this country. Cause everyone always says that the fight is about religious freedom, but you know what? I see the church worshiping more vibrantly in places where there's not religious freedom than I do here. I think it's, I think our, our, our deep lust is so tied into our fight for America in American Christianity and nobody wants to actually call it out. Our materialism yeah. is just, uh, it's, it's ruining our, our, our understanding and our clear vision and our clear ability to see him and follow him. Well, and, and again, I mean, you want to talk about deception going back 2000 years, going back to Constantine when, when Christianity became part of the institution, totally. um, we, we, we lost the, uh, we've lost the value of of personal intimacy. Totally. There's something about the herd instinct of man. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm a Christian because I'm surrounded by uh, people who say they're Christians, and yep. I live in a Christian nation, so it's easy for me to think I'm a Christian. And yep. and yet, when God begins to search our hearts and yep. begins to expose these things, even after 42 years in the Lord. I mean, yeah. you know, you and you have, you have become my confessor in many ways. And, and <laughs> you know, some of the deep struggles uh, that I have, that I've got to continually go to the Lord with and, and surrender and say, Lord, not my will, but be done, you know, but your will yeah. be done. Your redemption, your plan of redemption is better than the redemption I want from you um, yeah. in, in areas Ooh, of my life. Man. Yeah. And, uh, and, and to surrender to that is such a deep struggle. It is, it is, it is literally going to that emotional cross. No one will go yeah. to the cross like Jesus did, but still yeah. for us to experience life, we've got to go to the, we've got to go to the cross with our own will and our own personal desires, uh, yeah. and our own personal needs. We cannot yeah. continue our Christianity in a survival mode where give me what I need for my life to be better. We yep. can't base our Christianity on that. The end yep. times will not tolerate it because we are not going to get, I don't think, we're going to get what we want the way we want it. That exactly. is not to disparage God's provision. That is not to disparage God's promises. God's promises yep. are yes and amen. Uh, but yep. so often we expect them in the package that we demand rather than what he wants to give, which ultimately is better for us than what we would have for ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you, 
even imagine how good heaven's going to be and how amazing the next life's going to be. And and can you imagine a world that's completely restored, com- actually not restored, made over, brand new, where Jesus is ruling and reigning as king and everyone who's there is completely devoted to him? It, can you even imagine how good that would be? Because I... I try and I struggle and I I can only help but think that when God says you haven't even imagined the things that I've prepared for those who love me, that's kind of what he means. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine how good it's going to be. Like I know how much I love my wife and to think that I won't even be married to her and it won't bother me at all is unfathomable to me. Yeah, It's unfathomable that we could all be so, in love and enraptured by our bridegroom as his body in the new heaven and the new earth, that we won't even think one second about the good things we had in this life because those things will be so much better. And yet we see this theme all through scripture where it's, we, and I think we talked about this early in one of the early, early episodes, we so easily forsake the giver for the gifts as fallen people, mm-hmm. we forsake the giver for the gifts. We want what we want here and now. You brought up Judas. What about Simon the sorcerer? Who's like, hey, hey, can, can, how much is it going to cost me in order to have Ooh. this gift that you have? And Peter said, essentially, to hell with your money. It's a funny thing, Rich. I got a call from someone today who listens to the podcast. I have I haven't heard from this person. I mean, I hadn't talked to this person in 10 years up until a few months ago, but called me this morning on Facebook Messenger on a phone call and said, I have a question. The parable where Jesus, you know, invites people to the wedding and then they don't want to come. And then he ends up bringing all these people from the outer, you know, the outer byways and highways. And this guy shows up and Jesus says, well, the master of the wedding feast says, where's your wedding garments? You don't have your wedding garments on get out. You're, you're not welcome. Who told you to come in here without wedding garments? And he's like, what are the wedding garments? <laughs> and we, <laughs> and we wound up in this whole deep conversation and, and, and part of it came back to the parable, not even a parable, the, the moment where Jesus says, there's going to be people on that day who said we did works. We cast out devils. We did miracles. We spoke in tongues. Mind you, this is happening before Pentecost, this conversation. And Jesus is going to say, but I never knew you. I never knew you. You never said, search me and know me. Mm -hmm. You never sought me so that I could know you. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that we can't talk about how the elect are going to be deceived if we don't talk about some of these things. Yeah. uh, Yeah. It's so key for us to recognize the totality of God's acceptance of us when we turn to him, Mm, that he wants us to come just as we are, uh, that it's religion and, and, and pure fantasy to think that we can somehow clean ourselves up, uh, and, 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 and be acceptable in his eyes, you know, based on us trying to make ourselves better. Yeah. Uh, you know, this has been one of the hallmarks of my Christianity, and and I have I have raised a lot of eyebrows with the uh, the being too transparent with religious people about the depth of my um, confrontations or conversations with God, uh, and and I yeah. think you know I, I think you've probably seen some of them um, in, in some of our conversations that. Just because the Bible says it doesn't mean I'm going to accept it. I need him. I need <laughs> him to change me. I need him to give me a revelation. I need, yeah. you know, I'm in this, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm in this to be with you. You're in this to be with me. I'm in this to be with you. Now let's now, now I'm going to be real with you about everything. Yeah. It's, yeah. it can be ugly behind the scenes yeah. in a marriage. As a counselor, I encourage people be transparent and be real with each other. the The goal is, if you're going to have what you originally wanted from marriage, was to be authentic, be real, yeah. but don't yeah. be personally threatened by it. As long as your hearts are to have that oneness that you originally desired when you first got married, 
Don't be threatened yeah. by it, but be yeah. real, be authentic, uh, but then pursue God's heart and God's will for, for solutions. And, and I think yeah. that's so true in our relationship with God. He wants yeah. us to be real. It says, come boldly. Yeah. That means come raw and real. Come yep. boldly into the throne room, and I will give you mercy and grace. Yeah. You know, that's the love of God. And, and to, yeah. to, to believe in the totality of that love gives us permission to come in as we are uh, with, the, with a willingness to be encountered and transformed. Um, it might sound heretical when someone hears Rich say, I'm not just going to do what the Bible says because it says it. I want to know God in it. I want to be with God in it. And I want everyone to hear the heart behind what he's saying because it is the heart of God. Uh, does God want us to be obedient? Absolutely. But what Rich is saying is my heart cries out to God. God, I don't just want to do things for the sake of being obedient. I want to know you and be known by you in the midst of it. In other words, I want my heart to be transformed so that it's like your heart, so that I'm not acting just out of obedience. I'm acting, my obedience is based in my total and complete surrender and oneness to you. Um, do you do you know what Solomon asked God for and God loved it and and and, and rewarded him for it? He just asked for he asked for wisdom to rule over this great people. Yeah, and, and and you know what I, I discovered recently because I'm I'm once again in another Hebrew class for my uh, school program, and so I'm having to deep dive in a lot of Hebrew, and I never ever knew this before. There is a very specific word in Hebrew that is translated almost always in the in the in the Hebrew Bible uh, as wisdom. It's the word hokma, wisdom, 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 and for some reason. What Solomon asked for has been translated as wisdom for years in most English Bibles. And I and I I think I understand why. I think it's because it's easier to convey than what he actually said. The literal thing that he asked for in Hebrew, you know what it was? He asked for a listening heart. Wow. 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 A wow. Listening heart. That is that he is wanted, so beautiful. He wanted a heart that would hear the Lord and listen to him and be able to receive from him whatever he had to give. Wow. That's that what is, he asked for. That takes it to a whole new level. Yeah. That really, that yeah. do we have, do we have the courage uh, to listen to what he has to say? Yes. Yes. Okay. We can finish on that one. Hey brother, <laughs> we've got like a few minutes left and, and, we touched on where, where we're going to go, but why don't you just preview it? Cause then next episode we can jump right in. Where do you want to go next episode as we are in like maybe the last one or two or few episodes of God save America. You touched on it early on, but then we kind of got sidetracked as we often do. We need to have, uh, we need to take the makeup off. We need to get naked and we need to stand in a mirror and we need to see our true condition. We I took a sip of water right as you said. <laughs> when you take the makeup off, get naked, stand in the mirror. <laughs> I love you, man. Uh, and get raw and, and real. We have to if if we are going to successfully transition into the return of Christ, mm -hmm. we have to have that that vulnerability. Uh, that says, search me and know me. Come after yeah. those areas of unbelief. Come after those areas uh, where, where my survival is more important than your salvation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we think we can do these, these, uh, oh, man. These survival, use the Bible for our own survival rather than, uh, it's religious to say the glory of God, but, but, yeah. Rather than using the scripture as an opportunity for communion with God, that yeah. is our most successful um, uh, avenue to uh, to get through these times. Scripture always says, "Take refuge in me. Yeah. Take refuge in me." Um, yeah. There are so many scriptures. Maybe we'll get into more. Maybe we'll get more biblical uh, in the next broadcast to build people's faith. Yeah. To endure the labor pains that are yeah. coming. 
There's so yeah. many scriptures that that call us into a dependency upon the nature of God through yeah. difficult times. And yeah. and ultimately it's going to come to Revelation 12 where it says we not only overcame by the blood of the lamb by the word of our testimony, we are going to be so caught up in in God's love for us that it yeah. will be more important than our own personal survival. Yes. Our goal yes. is the kingdom. Our goal is eternal life and eternal communion with God yeah. and his people. And just like right. you said, it's, it's, if we had any concept of how amazing it was, we would have the heart of Paul that says, I count the suffering of this world to be nothing in comparison yes. uh, to what's in store for me and the, the inheritance yes. that we have in Christ. Yes. Um, yes. And so that's, so I, I, I not only want to, I not only want to explode, ex expose the depravity of every individual and every church and every church leader, I want to build up <laughs> our faith in the love of God, yeah. that he yeah. is faithful to cleanse us from all yeah. that unrighteousness so that we, so that we can minimize the pain of labor. Yes. If we can yeah. have faith in the outcome and the goodness of God, uh, then we'll allow him to search us and know us and have that that heart of David. And yeah. uh, and but but for me, uh, maybe it's my flesh. Maybe it's me getting stuff off my chest. But it's time to go after the church. It really mm. is time to go after the church and and expose the self serving nature of the church. It's mm. and and be absolutely blunt and and offensive about it. Mm -hmm. And you have permission, mm -hmm. you have permission to uh, hit the mute button at any time and wave and say, wait a second, <laughs> Rich, you're crossing the line. But but <laughs> I, I I feel that sometimes, sometimes there needs to be uh, just a deep, profound uh, confrontation with our need for a savior. And that means yeah. exposing our depravity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and good, because as you were talking, I, I, I feel like I got just exactly how we're going to start next episode. And I'm going to ask you to define, and we'll, we'll talk about it together. What is Christian humanism? Yes, that, that is, what is, that is the core. And that, that will is, be our on-ramp. That's, that's the core of the deception. And, and I realize, think that's a great place to start. Yeah. Do you realize how full circle like this is bringing us even in our own friendship? Because when we first met and we were we were part of the, uh, the, the same sort of home group in Encinitas like nine, ten years ago, we started meeting at Starbucks and eating VG's donuts on Saturdays. And we were talking about the sovereignty of God. And we were mm -hmm. talking about how could it be that God is as sovereign as he is, even though things happen that he hates all the time. And yet we're not Calvinists. We were both pretty sure about that, <laughs> yeah. but how could it be that he's sovereign and we have free will? And this is just kind of a personal thing with us, but this is really coming around full circle. When we talk about Christian humanism and the depravity of the church and what we need in order to be prepared for the end, in order to be, have our, our listening hearts completely set and geared up and ready for that moment, when it can be said, the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and we did not love our lives unto death. We actually saw and experienced and lived out koinonia with Jesus because we were willing to endure hardship for our faith in him and with faith in him and through faith in him. Uh, we have to have all these conversations. Mm -hmm. how, how do we understand God's goodness in light of the fact that we live in a sinful fallen world? And are we just going to be like Job and his friends who said, as long as we get what we want here and now, we're good. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if we don't get what we want here and now we're out because that, that is not the kind of faith that's going to endure to the end. Exactly. Yeah. And, that's and right. I, I really want to separate soul and spirit that, that despite our depravity, God is really for us. God is such an advocate for us that he sent his yep. only son to, to die on the cross while we were yet sinners. Uh, th yep. There wasn't a, there wasn't um, a a a a promise from God the Father that every single person he died for was going to come to him, mm -hmm. but he was willing to do it out of this agape love uh, and yeah. devotion. So how much more now that we've accepted him is yeah. he going to be our advocate and for us? And we need to we need to find that way of tapping into 
uh, that incredible love uh, so that um, so that our depravity, our self-serving depravity doesn't rob us of it. So. Boom. All right, brother. Well, we're, well, we're teed up. We're teed up for next one. Again, I'm excited for the next one. All right. Well, yeah. hey, everyone, uh, if you didn't catch our episode of that, you may know him from this past Wednesday about the four horsemen in Revelation 6. Just so you know, uh, we're not doing any. The only podcast that we're doing in the month of December are maybe one or two more God Save America's with Rich. Other than that, that You May Know Him podcast has been going for two years, and we've taken very, very, very few weeks off. So we're taking December off, uh, and we'll be back in January. Things will look a little bit different, but That You May Know Him will be back in full force and revamped and better than ever. But if you're following this series, Rich and I will be back over the next couple of weeks to have a few more of these and continue this discussion. And hopefully eventually we'll wrap it up. Um, so I don't know, Rich, next week or the week after we'll be back on Friday to pick up this conversation. Sound good. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. And, and uh, thank you for letting me indulge my passion. You got it, brother. Absolutely. Back at you. Thanks for the fellowship through fellowship through discernment and vice versa. Discernment through fellowship. I love it. Seeking the Lord. Okay, my friend. Bless you. You too. And thanks for listening to That You May Know Him. Stay blessed, live loved, and we'll talk to you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. Also, please consider giving us a five-star review and telling your friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and check out our website for tons of free, biblically-based content like Bible studies, devotionals, articles, and Bible teachings. The That You May Know Him podcast is produced by That You May Know Him Ministries, Durham, North Carolina. You can visit our website at thatyoumayknowhim.com.